Anytime you want. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Short introduction, please. Uh, two words. Okay. It's a great pleasure to have uh, Dick here come and give us a, a, a seminar in the uh, Institute of Energy Efficiency. Um, so normally, if you're looking for Dick, you have a choice of two places: either out cross-country skiing, or if you ever get on the ice and try and play hockey, I'd watch out. <laughs> I do not. You do not. Okay. Uh, so anyway, he's today. He's here to talk about compatibility, hysteresis, and direct conversion of uh, heat to electricity. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. So uh, um, thank you very much. And uh, it, it was a, indeed a surprise to see my undergraduate professor in modern physics, Professor Petter Estrup, in, in the audience here. So I remember very distinctly him talking about the little oscillators. You know, in my, its modern physics course. We had many little oscillators. Um, and I also would like to acknowledge, uh, over the years, I did many collaborations with Chris Palmstrom. Hopefully, they'll be uh, renewed and continued in the future. And uh, so a lot of my thinking is, owes its, uh, any, anything that's useful about it to, uh, to discussions with Chris. And also, I have a wonderful postdoc, Vijay Srivastava, who discovered many of the things I'll show you. So I'm going to show you um, a new method of converting heat to electricity uh, with, we think, a lot of potential. Certainly, there's a lot of ways to implement the idea. And um, I'm also going to show you the, the, the um, scientific basis for this. It's a breakthrough in the understanding of hysteresis and phase transformations, which really makes this possible. And I'll, I'll show that to you as well. So. Um, the, the method of, of energy conversion that I'll describe is, is, seems to be adapted to the case where the energy is more stored at a relatively small temperature difference, like 10 degrees to 100 degrees C, something like that. And if you think about it, um, there's really a lot of sources on Earth at small temperature difference. Of course, we think about the deserts and the Arctic, and I'll come back to that later. Um, U.S. industry consumes a terawatt, or 1 15th of all the power consumed on Earth, 25 to 50 percent of this is rejected as waste heat, and 60 percent of that is so-called low-grade waste heat, which is, you could consider, in this small temperature regime. Um, the U.S. data centers uh, now consume 2.5 percent of the national energy budget, so there's an amazing source of heat there in the small temperature difference regime. There's also waste heat for laptop and desktop computers, and also handheld electronic devices. So in, that, in those scenarios, one would really like to take the heat that's, uh, of course, a big problem in these computers and turn it directly into electricity and use it to recharge the battery, say, in a, in a handheld device, but uh, recover it, perhaps, in a, in a data center scenario. And, and in that case, uh, one would really like to do this in a film setting. And uh, I won't talk too much about that, but uh, we don't know much about that, but uh, it's an interesting direction. Of course, the waste heat from automobile exhaust systems and air conditioning systems for buildings in particular and also power plants, and the accumulated heat in attics and roofs. So, and finally, another thing I'll come back to is, uh, is the growing list of solar thermal plants. So there's a lot of potential ways, natural and also man-made waste heat sources that could be um, um, potential sources for an energy conversion method at small temperature difference. So um, the method of doing this is, 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 is relies on first-order phase transformations in, in solids. So one crystalline phase to another. Sometimes we call those Martensitic phase transformations. And also magnetism. But you could also think of other properties. And I'll come back to that later. 
Um, the reason for this way of thinking is that um, magnetic properties are, are generically sensitive to the lattice parameters of the material. The classic example, which is also controversial, is the diffusion of nitrogen into iron, which expands the lattice and improves the magnetic properties. Uh, and first order phase transformations have a change of lattice parameters. That's the type I'll look at. I'll look at transformations with a real transformation strain, maybe like 10% transformation strain, big first order phase transformations. And therefore, um, since they have a change of lattice parameters and magnetic properties are sensitive to the lattice parameters, you can think about, if you design the material property, switching back and forth between completely different materials magnetically. That's what I'll, I'll try to do. The other thing about them is their phase transformation, so they have latent heat. And so that's critically important because you want to be able to take a a large fraction of that latent heat and convert it into electricity. As many single phase materials, for example, a magnetic material where it's near a skiri point, which has, can be made to have a large change of magnetization, but it absorbs negligible heat. So the latent heat part is also an important role. And the key problem, of course, is that many first or, big first order phase transformations are not reversible, um, or you can only reverse them. 10 times or 50,000 times or even 500,000 times, it's not enough for energy conversion applications. So the reversibility of the phase transformation is also very important. And then, of course, we think about many different uh, ways to use this. So I'm going to discuss the reversibility of phase transformations. And that's the um, scientific part of the talk here. And um, to, to give you an example of a phase transformation which is not reversible, that that's the element tin. So if you cool tin to minus 15 C, this is what happens to it. It under, undergoes this phase transformation, and it completely tears itself apart. Um, so that's an example of a phase transformation which is really not reversible. If you would read in uh, papers about this phase transformation, people would say it has its volume change is big, and there, therefore it, it, tear, it breaks itself. So this is. Not, not acceptable. I'll also come back to that point about the volume change. Um, okay, so, um, uh, so this kind of phase transformation I'll look at is, as I said, it's called a Martensitic phase transformation. Uh, here's a very simple example um, in which the, this is a, a kind of temperature axis. That's a kind of transformation temperature. And there's a, this, this has a cubic phase as the stable phase at high temperature. And it, and it distorts at the phase transformation by, say, elongating along the O1 axis. Or, of course, there's three symmetry equivalent axes. And so you get three elongations. And these are called the variants of the martensite phase. So the terminology is this is the austenite phase, and these are the variants of martensite. Um, and I'm going to talk about, um, as a measure, so we're going to talk about the reversibility of phase transformations. And the measure of reversibility will be this hysteresis. So first, let me discuss, there's, there's hysteresis in transforming from this variant of Martensite to this variant of Martensite. And there's an experimental measurement. I won't describe how it was done. It was done with stress. This is some kind of measure of the stress. It was done with a particular design of a loading device that was designed to give a nice square hysteresis loop. And so that's the hysteresis loop. And this is the volume fraction of this variant versus this variant. It goes from 0 to 1. And so you can see that it it transforms in one direction at some stress and in the reverse direction at a different stress. But the, the main reason I put this up here is that in this experiment, the rate of loading was varied by two orders of magnitude. But you can see that the hysteresis is about the same. And that's so-called rate-independent hysteresis. And that's the typical kind of hysteresis in, in uh, phase-transforming materials. There is a small rate component, but the main part is, is, is rate independent and does not shrink to zero no matter how slow you, you do the loading or you do the changes of temperature. So there's, of course, the main, the main subject for the next few slides will be the hysteresis in passing from one phase to another. That's thermal hysteresis. And that has a typical hysteresis loop that might look like that. People usually fit the by a parallelogram, and that gives them four temperatures, MF, MS, AF, AS, AF, austenite start, austenite finish, martensite start, martensite fin finish, that 
that defines the hysteresis loop. So sometimes I'll show you some graphs with those. The width of the hysteresis will be a very typical graph. Okay. So you can look up in um, textbooks about the origins of hysteresis in materials. And you'll see, you'll see the two typical arguments would be, one is related to thermal activation. I guess that would be well known by this audience. Um, not many people subscribe to this um, because of the rated dependent nature that I was just discussing. So people would usually say thermal activation is there, but it's not so important. It's not the main thing. People would usually say that it's the pinning of interfaces that, by defects that is responsible for hysteresis. And they would say, this idea is really borrowed in a bit from, a bit from magnetism. They say, they say that there's an interface between the two phases. It, it, it comes eventually up against the defect, which is non-transforming. It requires an additional lowering of the free energy of the new phase to, to, to get this interface to snap through the defect, increase the driving force to snap through the defect. And, there, and this is the, it happens both ways through the phase transformation, and this is responsible for hysteresis. Okay, so my point is, I, I believe that neither of these ideas is the main idea behind hysteresis. And uh, generally in structural phase transformations, I'm going to try to explain what I think is important and what we do to reduce it. Okay, so the way, so to start to do that, I have to say a couple of technical things. So here's a different martin Siddick phase transformation um, that's a cubic to orthorhombic case. So that, that would be, here's a V2 structure and it, and it, and it shortens at the phase transformation, and, and that shortening is described by this constant beta, lattice parameter beta. And, um, and it also, it also uh, the, the top of this becomes, instead of a square, becomes a rhombus, and there's two other lattice parameters, alpha and gamma, here. And the, the matrix, which describes the linear transformation from here to here, you can think of that as a linear transformation, is that matrix. It depends on lattice parameters. That's going to play an important role in my talk. So, in fact, the way I wrote this matrix is alpha, beta, and gamma are the eigenvalues of that matrix, but I'm going to need the ordered eigenvalues. So I'm going to rename them, lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3. And what plays a critical role in my talk is, is, is the middle eigenvalue of this matrix, lambda 2. So, so this is called the transformation stretch matrix or transformation matrix. Its middle eigenvalue is lambda 2. Okay, so that's just some technical things. So actually, this picture almost, this is a textbook picture of phase transformations. It almost never happens in real materials. Okay, what, what really happens in materials is this. Is real materials, uh, martin Siddick materials are complex lattices. There's modulation, there's shuffling. So the real situation is, is this down here. There's a number of Bravais lattices. I pictured three of them here based at these three colored atoms. I drew it in two dimensions. To, and each of those Bravais lattices undergoes a distortion. In fact, it undergoes exactly the same linear transformation. It has to do that by periodicity. And it's that transformation which, which I'm going to be calling the, the middle eigenvalue of that transformation is important. That's what governs the long range stress fields and things I'm discussing. So in reality, the textbook picture is too simple, but uh, anyway, it's sort of similar idea, and it's the middle eigenvalue that's important. Okay, so I also am not going to talk too much about theory, but I want to say that, that most of what I'll tell you is, is, is directly a result of doing some calculations on theories of this type. They're kind of continuum theories, a bit like micromagnetics, but they include phase transformation. So there's, you could think there's uh, exchange energy like micromagnetics, there's uh, Zeeman energy. This determinant is the fact, because of the fact that we have to worry about a reference configuration and a deformed configuration. There's the usual stray field energy, and you solve these differential equations to get this field, H. That gives rise to the shape effect. And most importantly is there's a, um, a free energy which depends on magnetization, temperature, and deformation gradient. So I'm using a large strain description, and that's critically important here, actually. It's, it's important to, to model the geometric changes in the lattice with, with perfect accuracy and not use linearized strain. Okay, so if you don't know what that means, it doesn't matter. But uh, anyway, it's important in the technical side. 
And the point about phi is that it has various energy wells, which I've schematically pictured here. If you want to think about phi as, as being above the board and uh, the graph of phi, and it comes down and hits this screen at, at these circles, and so it has energy wells, austenite and martensite energy wells. And the exact placement of those energy wells and, and, and how you describe them is a critically important part of what I'll say, but I'm not going to give you a course on, uh, on, on this theory. But this is, this is where it comes from. And, and of course, what happens when you transform, of course, you can have uh, shape changes because of the distortion and the phase transformation, but you also can have magnetism. And so there's magnetic domains and sometimes within. This would be a very typical picture of a low energy uh, structure predicted by this kind of theory. All right, now, now I want to show a picture of a phase a Martin City phase transformation, which is a bit more reversible than the last one. But, and it's an it's interesting story. So that's, that's a single variant, of, that's a single crystal, and that's a single variant of Martin site. And um, this is what happens when you transform. So that's just heating it up. And the interesting thing about this picture, that's austenite now. The interesting thing about this picture is this is a microstructure of martensite that appeared. So by transforming from austenite to martensite, the, the, uh, the new phase is austenite. But it, the, in order to get there, it created a microstructure in the martensite. The disappearing phase was forced to create a microstructure. So it's, and where, what is this coming from? It's coming from the fact that, that, that austenite and a single variant of martensite are not compatible with each other. And I'll explain that in a minute. But somehow, you, it, with this microstructure, this is the kind of low energy pathway between those two phases. So let me show it again. And this is, this is uh, the typical mode of phase transformation in uh, first order phase trans structural phase transformation for no diffusion. It's called the austenite martensite interface. And everything I'm going to say for the next sl few slides occurs when the middle eigenvalue of the transformation stretch matrix is not equal to 1. Okay, and there's the austenite phase. That's a kind of shot. It's a different material than the previous picture, but, but it's this, it's it's uh, qualitatively the same microstructure. It's quantitatively a bit different. Um, so the point is, the austenite is not compatible with a single variant of martensite, and again, I'll explain more. But it's compatible with 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 a fine layering of two variants of martensite. This is alternating bands of martensite. So what's the explanation? So I'm going to take that previous theory, I'm going to kill the magnetism, and I'm going to do energy optimization. And there's the, the description of the energy wells of, of the martensite. And roughly, sp and the free energy then becomes simply a function of deformation gradient and temperature. It's minimized at those matrices. There's some kind of rotational invariance. It doesn't matter if you don't understand that. Point is that I take, I take two states, one variant and another variant. I allow a rotation. And I consider a deformation, which <clears throat> is energy minimizing. And it has to be compatible. It doesn't come apart at the interface. So that, that compatibility condition means that these two matrices differ by a rank one matrix. Again, again it's, the details are not important. But there's a compatibility condition across that interface, which means that those two, that deformed shape doesn't come apart and, <coughs> and sticks together. It's a continuous deformation. And if you saw that's an algebraic condition, and if you solve that condition, you get two solutions. You interpret them as, as type one and type two twins. All the geometry of that picture agrees with that picture. The normal is predicted correctly. If you go to atomic scale, the shape changes are correctly predicted. Everything in that picture in that calculation agrees with this. For one of those types. In fact, it's the type two twin in that case. <coughs> okay. Now so take, take those two deformation gradients and layer them over here, alternating with a certain volume fraction lambda. And I introduced another parameter, k, here. When k gets large, this gets finer and finer. So it allows me to control the fineness independent of the volume fraction. Okay. And over here, you put a, a state which, is, which is corresponds to the austenite energy well. And you first find that, that, that again, this, there's no continuous deformation which has this value here and, and these values over here. So you're forced to put in a transition layer. 
and that's what the real material does too. It puts in a transition layer. And there's elastic energy in this transition layer. So the, and the point is the following. If I, if I arrange, so there's a normal to this, if I may arrange this interface to have just the right normal, and I choose this lambda to be just the right volume fraction, then <coughs> it's possible to reduce that elastic energy to zero, to drive it to zero by making the twins finer and finer. Okay? So that's a mathematical calculation. It's just a matter of putting in a transition layer and seeing what happens when you, when you make this finer and finer, and you get some result. But you have to take a particular normal and a particular volume fraction. If you take that normal and you compare with the normal to that surface, you get really nice agreement. <coughs> And if you take the, 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 the angle between those twin bands and the interface and compare with that angle, you'll get super nice agreement. It's been done many times in many different martensitic phase transformations. It's basically called the crystallographic theory of martensite. I'm just explaining it in a more energetic way than it's usually explained. Okay, now, and it, it, there's some results. This is all in the case lambda 2 is not 1. Turns out there are four normals to this interface. You give the twin system their four normals. Correspondingly, there are two volume fractions of the twins. Okay, that's a bit technical, but. Okay, so that was considered a, a great advance somehow to explain that interface and so forth. Um, but of course, it, it, this, this theory is miserably, is a miserable failure about one thing. It says that the twins need to be infinitely fine, but of course, to drive the elastic energy to zero, but of course the twins over here are not infinitely fine in the, in the picture. And that's also understood. And the reason for that is that there's a small interfacial energy on the boundaries of those bands. And by making the twins finer and finer, you, you, you drive the interfacial energy to infinity, and so that's unacceptable. If you make them coarse, very coarse, and the interfacial energy is small, then the bulk energy of the elastic transition layer is, is too big. And so this picture represents a compromise between the interfacial energy on the twins and the bulk energy in the elastic transition layer. Okay? That's well accepted. And there's many points of contact that I'm not telling you with experiment about the fineness. Of course, I already talked about the geometry, but uh, about the fineness and so forth and so on. To predict the fineness correctly, you need uh, to bring in this interfacial energy. And there's also branching here. That's also understood, so there's a lot understood about this picture. Okay, so the, um, the problem is, as I say, that the, the there's, there's, there's energy left over in this interface. And we, we, got to, we, we began to theorize by looking at various cases that this energy is the main reason for hysteresis in phase transformation. It's not pinning or thermal activation. And it goes like this, is that, whoops, <coughs> is that, oh, I lost a, oh yeah, well, okay, I didn't lose a slide, I just lost <laughs> my train of thought. <laughs> okay, very good. Okay, so first of all, there's a summary of the crystallographic theory. It says that there are four solutions to twin systems. Those are the analytically calculated solutions. One of those solutions agrees very well with that picture, correspondingly two volume fractions, so forth. Okay, so for this hysteresis, we, we believe that it, it's due to that leftover interfacial uh, energy in that interface. Both bulk elastic energy and interfacial energy, the sum of the two. And the idea is the following. You're lowering the, the, say you're cooling the material through the phase transformation. You have no martensite there. Martensite starts to form. But you, as soon as it forms, there's this extra energy just because austenite is against martensite. And you have to pay for this energy. You pay for this energy by having to lower the temperature more to make the free energy of the new phase lower to, to have a free energy decreasing path through the phase transformation. Okay, now, okay, so there's one mathematical result. So there's, as I said, the austenite is, is not compatible with the martensite, a single variant of martensite, but it can be. And the middle eigenvalue of that matrix being one is a necessary sufficient condition that the that the martensite is compatible with the austenite. The compatibility condition between aus aus martensite and austenite is satisfied. And if that's satisfied, uh, there's, I drew a picture. So this, I took a matrix U1 whose middle eigenvalue is one. And in fact, there are two, when it's satisfied, there are two solutions. They look like this. So there's a case where 
there's a distortion over here. There's no distortion over here, but they still fit together perfectly on an interface. So I've completely eliminated this elastic transition layer and this interfacial energy. If this is the reason for hysteresis, the, hist the size of the hysteresis loop should, should go down when you do this. Okay, so that's the experimental test is tune the comp lambda 2 does depend on composition because this transformation stretch matrix depends on composition. So you, you start tuning the composition to make the middle eigenvalue transformation stretch matrix 1. And then you should change from those kind of interfaces to those kind of interfaces. Okay, so we, we did that um, and we, we saw an amazing drop. Um, so this is a compilation of a lot of data. This was the first data done in my lab in these things. And then combinatorial synthesis people got interested in this. And it's, it, it's a wonderful area for combinatorial synthesis. And they, they managed to get the hysteresis down to, so the hysteresis, not plotted versus composition, but plotted versus this middle eigenvalue. And there's one. And so you, you seem to be able to drive the hysteresis. The, they got a little enthusiastic and they said they drove the hysteresis to zero. Okay. Um, well, okay. <laughs> you also notice that the, the minimum of this graph is not at one. It's displaced slightly to the left of one. Um, in fact, they, they realized that, that there was, in fact, stress on the in the films when they were doing these measurements. And uh, there's, in fact, a measurement of that stress here and, a, and an accounting for that stress. I think it's, a, okay, I'm not sure I buy everything that was done here. And I didn't do this. And, and, but anyway, the, the end result was this graph, which was minimized here, moved over to there. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, these are, there's alloys in here with transformation strain on the order between 5 and 10 percent with 1 and 2 degrees hysteresis. That's extremely unusual. But we routinely make those alloys now. There's a lot of starting points in a lot of systems, metals and oxides. It's a quite generic way to reduce hysteresis. Okay. Now here's something. We, we, if you think back to that tin, I, we were saying that the typical explanation is tin tears itself apart because the volume changed. So now I have this combi data here. And, I, and I, in fact, I, I, not only I not only measured, or, or they all not only measured the middle eigenvalue, they measured all three eigenvalues. And the product of the eigenvalues, which is the determinant of this matrix, when it's one, so this one here corresponds to no volume change in the material. Okay, so and this is the hysteresis being plotted here. So I'm replotting the data. But now versus the vo volume ratio of the two phases. So of course, if, there's any, if there was anything that had to do with lattice parameters that should affect, people would believe would affect hysteresis, it would be the volume change, just like I discussed earlier. Um, because, of course, when the volume change, when this, when this is not one, it means the new phase is growing up in a hole of the wrong volume. So there has to be a lot of stress there, right? But if you plot the data, instead of against the middle eigenvalue, you plot it versus the same data versus the volume ratio. At volume ratio one, you get some of the smallest hysteresis and some of the largest hysteresis. This is actually a subset of the data that was done earlier. But that's, uh, there seems to be no correlation with the volume ratio of the two phases correlates very well with the middle eigenvalue. Okay, here's a picture, TEM picture of, of in an alloy which is tuned to have lambda 2 equals 1. Actually, it's not quite lambda 2 equals 1 because, okay, it's a funny thing because this is evolution in our thinking. Uh, so that alloy is actually right there. And it's about, you know, 14 degrees hysteresis or something. And we used to think, and that's 11 in this system, this uh, titanium nickel palladium, that, that's what we used to think was the lambda 2 equals 1 alloy because of that previous graph. And um, in any case, in that alloy, at high resolution, you see um, perfect interfaces between austenite and martensite. They have normal 7, minus 5, minus 5. That's that end. Um, the angle, angle phi you can measure between lattice planes here, that's actually the angle in this rotation matrix Q. And so everything nicely agrees with, with um, in that, that picture with the uh, compatibility condition between the austenite and the martensite. And actually, the whole microstructure changes. It gets much simpler. 
there's uh, many interfaces between austenite and martensite. Uh, it's quite different from the other case. So now um, <coughs> we, in, in bulk, we wanted to try to get some of these extremely low zero hysteresis alloys. So we, we, were work, we worked in the titanium nickel palladium system. And we started varying composition, but we did it by, by quarter percent increments. So it was quite difficult to making a lot of alloys. And we found this was what we previously believed on the previous graph was the lowest hysteresis case. And we could actually reduce it to about two degrees hysteresis. And, and so now that's replotted. That's versus composition. This is, this is replotted versus the middle eigenvalue. Again, there's a very sharp drop. This is a very much expanded graph. It's reproducible. Uh, so this one got three degrees hysteresis. But, um, so it's quite possible if you went in you know, one-eighth increments, you might get even lower hysteresis. I don't know. But anyway, uh, you have to be really close in composition. And that's why people did not notice this previously. Previously, people made a lot of alloys, so even in the nickel-titanium system. And they, they didn't notice this sharp drop in hysteresis just because you have to be at a very special composition to see that. Okay. Now, what matters more for energy conversion is, is not that. Is what, what matters is this. So this is DSC. So this is calorimetry. And I'm heating and cooling. And there's a peak here, which is the, which is the heat absorbed, the latent heat for, for one direction of phase transformation. Um, and um, I guess that's, that must be the heating direction. And this is the cooling direction. Yep. And uh, you can see that there's a kind of thickening of this. That's, that's and it's a little bit of a blow up here. It's not very clear on the screen. I'll show you a blow up again later. That's migration of the phase transformation temperature with cycle. And um, that's a known effect. It, it won't keep migrating forever. It migrates and then it eventually saturates. But that's considered a signature of damage in the material. Um, it's, uh, and, and so it's interesting to look at what happens to that when you go from this point here to middle eigenvalue equal to 1. And, and that dramatically changes. So it's about two orders of magnitude change in the migration of the phase transformation temperature uh, with cycle. And we, we take that to mean that this, this is in a definite improvement in the reversibility of the phase transformation. There's a blow up. Of, and you can see, again, uh, being, having lambda 2 very close to 1 is, is quite important to that. And um, so one could think that for this, for this alloy, there's, a, there's still a small transition layer left and some stress in that layer. Maybe the stress in that layer is sufficient to nucleate dislocations. That's creating damage in the material, and that's responsible for this migration. And when lambda 2 is 1, you remove that elastic transition layer. So that's a, a natural hypothesis, but uh, not proven for, for this case, for any case. OK. so. Again, there's the picture. OK, so this is what happens when lambda 2 is 1. The four solutions of the crystallographic theory that I described earlier, four per twin system, they reduce to these four. So um, in addition to losing the transition layer, besides the fact that the transition layer is lost and you get these single variant interfaces, um, there's no loss in the number of strains. You know, the average, there's, there's sort of four average strains over here. There's four strains over here. So once we saw this, we, we began to see, we were going to ask the question, are there other conditions of compatibility between phases giving even better compatibility than lambda 2 equals 1? Okay. And we found a really interesting condition. We call this the cofactor conditions. So you have to satisfy lambda 2 equals 1, and then you have to satisfy some other condition, which depends on the twin system. If it's satisfied for one twist, twin system, it's satisfied for usually many twin systems. So it's um, can be satisfied widely in the material, let's say. And there's some inequality that seems to be always satisfied. So. And if this cofactor conditions are satisfied, not only do you, of course, lambda 2 is 1. So you have the perfect interfaces between austenite and martensite for both the green variant and the blue variant. But in addition, you can continuously vary the volume fraction. And each of these interfaces is, is a low energy interface in the sense of the crystallographic theory. So there's a, and there's a whole bunch of strains. This continuously, this is not compatible because it doesn't strain as you change the volume fraction. It strains a lot. 
In fact, I drew up here the, the strain ellipsoids of the starting state and the ending state. So it's really, it's as if this ellipsoid gets continuously strained into this blue ellipsoid. And um, so, um, so, you know, there's a remarkable degree of compatibility here and, and presence of many, many strains. This is a really interesting condition. We noticed recently that in a special case of these conditions, which is, can be satisfied in real materials, not only do we have that, but we actually can have curved austenite martensite interfaces and no transition layer at all. So that you can see everything's fitting together here. It's like a jigsaw puzzle that all the pieces change shape, but they all perfectly fit together without stress, kind of like that. We have actually four materials that are very close to satisfying the cofactor conditions. VO2, could, we think it can be doped to satisfy those conditions, and even V2O3. And copper aluminum manganese type 2 twins and, and gold copper zinc type 1 twins. Are, this is probably the one we're closest now. So we hope to, to demonstrate this and we think this could have a tremendous reversibility in, in, in phase transformations. Okay. Uh, so now I want to switch subjects. I want to talk, I'm, I'm working my way back to energy conversion. And I want to, we started doing this kind of tuning of lattice parameters to make lambda 2 equals 1 in Heusler alloys. Of course, we like Heusler alloys because, first of all, they have a lot of phase transformations, and second of all, they love magnetism. And uh, it would be interesting to, to combine, as I was mentioning earlier, the uh, reversible phase transformations with a, with a big change in electromagnetic property. And um, there was, so there was an indication of phase transformations, very weak magnetism. Um, and uh, th in this particular alloy with 13% tin, Actually, strong magnetism was observed, but you had, to, you, have a very, you had to have a huge field, 7 Tesla, to produce that. Anyway, it was a very good starting point for us. And, um, and we started tuning. We took the simplest cases, um, nickel-2 manganese indium, nickel-2 manganese tin, and we started tuning the proportion of manganese and indium, manganese and tin to try to make lambda-2 equals 1. And we achieved that. So it turned out... Uh, we didn't do this high resolution tuning, so we have about six degrees hysteresis. Um, and it, it was at this composition with the tin and at this composition with the indium. If you replot the data, both of those squares go on top of each other at lambda 2 equals 1. Again, there's a sharp drop. There's a DSC graph using a really nice DSC graph with uh, about six degrees hysteresis. It didn't have any strong magnetism, but we had, we, we had an idea based on, a you know, based on some heuristics, let's say, um, how to get mag strong magnetism in this alloy. And this is by substituting cobalt for nickel. So we, and this is the alloy we ended up with. It has lambda 2 quite close to 1. It again has about 6 degrees hysteresis. There's a DSC graph. Transformation temperature is near uh, 1, 130, 140C. Um, but this is an interesting alloy because the Martin, this is magnetization versus temperature. The martensite is non-magnetic. It's probably anti-ferromagnetic. Um, and the austenite is ferromagnetic. But this is a really strong magnet. This, this is almost the strength of iron at that temperature, 1,200 EMU per centimeter cubed. Um, it's also a, quite a soft magnet. With, with about 300 ersteds, you nearly get the full magnetization. So it magnetizes very easily. That's the magnetization cur the curve. This is magnetization versus field. This is a martensite, a martensite here in austenite. Actually, if you look closely at the martensite, so these, notice that this axis is completely different from this axis. There is a, a, a tiny ferromagnetic component. So there's probably some magnetic particles there, and we're, we're trying to understand that a bit better. But, uh, but the main thing is there's a huge change in magnetization, and it's a quite soft magnetic material. Here's something that totally blows my mind. <laughs> um, here's, okay, nickel, cobalt, manganese, tin. You, you, y is the percentage of cobalt. The alloy I was just showing you was y equals 5. That's that alloy. You change two percentage points down to 3, and it, it, drops, it drops off almost to half in the magnetization. You change one percentage point in the other direction up to six, and it, it oh no, I'm sorry, six is, is this one, it's about half. Three is down here at about a third. So 
you know, it's really, you, you, you have 100 unit cells of this material in front of you, and you pluck out one nickel, and you stick a cobalt there, and the magnetization changes by a factor of two, you know. How, how could that happen? <laughs> so anyway, it's really something really interesting on in the basic magnetic side to understand that. Um, so here's, a, here's a, something, some little demonstration my students did. This, this is a little copper finger that's being heated. That's, a, that's a, a piece of that material. That's a permanent magnet. It's about eight centimeters away. And um, if, you, um, if you heat it up, of course, it jumps over to the magnet. Because <laughs> even though it's eight centimeters away, it's, got, it's sufficiently soft magnetic material that it becomes magnetized by the weak field of this permanent magnet, follows the field lines across, and, and jumps over to the permanent magnet. If you want to think about that in energy conversion terms, it's the direct conversion of heat to kinetic energy. Pretty silly, but anyway. OK, here's something more interesting about energy conversion. So we took a piece of that material, and we put it on top of a permanent magnet. And then we wrapped a coil around it. So, and then we heated it up. And uh, when we heat it up, it goes through the phase transformation, and it suddenly magnetizes. Uh, and it magnetizes to a big value. So you can think of in terms of Maxwell's equations, dm dt is very big. And d, but dm dt is kind of partitioned between dh dt and db dt. And, 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 and that partitioning is governed by micromagnetics. That's what micromagnetics, uh, it's, that's the subject part of it, or magnetostatics really, is, is that partitioning. So if you make the shape of the specimen correct, and you also think about some of the other micromagnetic aspects, a big dm dt gets translated into a big db dt. And db dt is curl E. So in other words, with the changing magnetization, you, you, you induce a, coil, a current in the coil. And there's no moving parts. And uh, of course, there's many different ways to design this. This is a little model based on those two equations and cylindrical symmetry. And everything's, all the uh, constants are known. And uh, so what we did when we saw the experiment is uh, we see the voltage pulse. And there's, there's another one, another voltage pulse, because of there was a decreasing magnetization on the other side, rapidly decreasing magnetization. There's uh, voltage versus temperature. It's slightly, slightly strange here because the, due to the latent heat absorption, there's a little non-monotonicity of the temperature versus time. So when you eliminate time between these two, you, you get this little. Anyway, it's not important. Um, we took a, re a reasonable from the measured data susceptibility versus time, and we calculated voltage versus time. And you can see it's even a simple model does quite well. So this design, I I'm, not, I'm not claiming anything about this design. This design is very bad. But uh, it does indicate a possible way to convert heat to electricity. Um, and you have, you have no generator. It does, the material does the work. Um, it's interesting to look at the thermodynamic cycles. Um, they're represented here. We actually built a little free energy. We calculated the entropy from this. And we have a nice representation of the entropy of this material, including these, these phase transformation and magnetism. And, and, but the main thing here is what happens when that's the applied field. And what happens during the thermodynamic cycle is when it starts transforming, it starts in inducing a current in the coil. And, and a critical role is played by the fact that the coil then puts a backfield on the, on the sample, it, reducing the magnetism. And that's this reduction from H0 to this value. That's critically important in the efficiency of this device. And in fact, you, what you would really like is a big effective field on transition temperature so that, um, and actually going the other way through the phase transformation, this, instead of jumping down, it jumps up. Um, so, so somehow understanding this is the critical part about the thermodynamics of uh, energy conversion using this method. So I can go into detail if anybody's interested, but uh, maybe I'll stop there. Um, we realized that using first order phase transformations and, and many different electromagnetic properties, um, uh, you, can, you can even anisotropy, you could work at a kind of intermediate field and by having a high anisotropy, low anisotropy phases, but, but more or less the same magnetization, you could build energy conversion device. Or instead of magnetization, you could use polarization. 
or more or less is a whole huge number of ways to use this idea with first order phase transformations. Um, so, of course, it's fun to think about, think big about these things. And uh, I had the benefit last summer of visiting Seville, Spain. It was a very nice trip. And I visited their solar thermal plant. It's, it's really huge, but in fact, this is a small one these days in, in the world. Now, governments are building much bigger ones. There's a truck down there, so there's a lot of, a huge field of mirrors there. They're focused on, uh, on the top of this uh, tower where there's a big black container, huge black container of water. And of course, the energy conversion is done by making steam. Uh, it's not so different from what Watt worked on you know, in the 18th century and so forth and so on. And uh, actually, that's, that's, that's me. If you look very carefully right there, look very carefully, you know, my knuckles were completely white because I'm afraid of heights. And this, even right there, is way up in the air, I'll tell you. This is a huge tower. This is, by the way, Nick Shrivers, who took the TEM picture I showed earlier. Um, so uh, the point is, with a material like I've been discussing, it, does, it seems like you don't need that tower. And you don't need all that infrastructure. You don't need those heat exchangers and those boilers and all those piping systems because you can have the material at the focal point of your mirror and you need a shuttering device to change the temperature. But potentially it's a, a very compact energy conversion require, device that requires no fluids and no pumping around. Of course, you can also think of, uh, you know, I don't know if it's desirable, but you certainly can notice that the, the water in the Arctic, for example, is at, z at zero degrees C, and the air just above the ice is minus 40 to minus 20 for 10 months. Of That's an ideal temperature difference for, for energy conversion by this method. And it's separated by usually much less than uh, two, you know, one or two meters of, of ice, but up to three meters of ice sheet. So one can think about uh, you know, um, quite unusual ways for, of energy conversion. Okay, so that's uh, that's my talk, and uh, this this was this is a nice picture of of the PD11 alloy, which has and there's a picture of the needle. Actually, it was taken by Remy uh, Shriver's student Delville, and neither Shriver's nor Delville wrote any paper in this journal. <laughs> but they got their picture on the front. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> uh, so that's a little summary. So I, uh, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Yes. Right. Right. So there are two. There are two different. There. There. The, the, the earlier picture, they weren't parallel, and here they're not parallel. And it's two different reasons. <laughs> okay, for here, the reason here, at least I believe, is that this this alloy, as I said earlier, this it's really 9.25 that has lambda two really equal to one. Okay, you have you'd have to say I'd have to say a tolerance, but this is not quite lambda two equals one, and I think and if that's if that's the case, then then there is there are then there. This, this, there's not a single interface here. There are several different interfaces nearby that are nearly compatible interfaces for, for this. And I think you're seeing two of those interfaces. So that's the explanation here. So this is, I would say this is slightly stressed. The real lambda 2 equals 1 alloy, if I took 9.25, would probably lie in the middle of this. And, and the fact it's perturbed is, is, is from the fact that this is not exactly satisfying lambda 2 equals 1. In the earlier case, the explanation is different. <laughs> in the earlier case is, then you had the austenite martensite interface with the bands. And if you look very carefully at the austenite martensite interface, the bands split as they get closer to the interface. There's a theory for that. Actually, it goes back to Lifshitz in a long time ago, but then uh, uh, Conan Mueller and other people looked at this. It has to do with it's energetically, actually energetically favorable if the bands do not remain the same thickness all the way up to the interface. And, and the reason is that if, if there are more bands near the interface, you, you can reduce, the, the, the more bands near the interface, the better, because you can reduce the elastic energy. 
So if you can imagine that if you had a branching phenomena where, where a few bands over here got finer and finer and finer as you approached the interface, you would have the benefits of having very small elastic energy. And you wouldn't pay too much interfacial energy because your interfaces, the number of interfaces would be graded. If this is done in exactly the right way, you show that you can show at least under some hypotheses on elastic moduli and so forth that, that it is energetically favorable to do this kind of branching. And that's believed to be the explanation in the, in the other case, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, they're all done on polycrystals. Yeah, how big are they? Um, various sizes. The, 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 um, the combi was done in a film setting. They're, and, and they're sputtered film. So they're on the order of a few microns thick. Um, and then they're diced up. You know, there's a the kind of compositional gradient. They're diced up. And then they're, they each one is, um, is uh, addressed with um, x-rays for the lattice perimeter measurements. But e even on that scale, the the, the dicing is much larger than the grain size. The grain size is on the order of the thickness. So, and then the bulk samples, those are arc melted buttons, uh, one centimeter. And those are probably grain size is uh, a few microns, something like that. So they're all on polycrystals. So there are many of these interfaces inside there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, if, if, you, if you could somehow do this with films, um, you, so the thing about films is you can, you, you can likely transform them very, very fast because the heat transfer is, so you could have a very fast shutter. On the other hand, the mass of the bill is very small. So, and, and there's also a micromagnetic aspect which, which scales in a kind of different way. So this, and the truth is, uh, I, th I haven't worked through that whole thing um, to, to, the, to the degree that I can say something confident up here. But if you could do films, of course, you would use much less material. That would also change the whole landscape of what kind of materials you could use, too. You have much more, much wider array of materials. Um, yeah. But in bulk, uh, we, we, you know, we, we could, you know, we could make we can make big ingots and dice them up with uh, EDM and so forth. We do that, actually, yeah. yeah. Oh, I was just going to ask if the branching is possible because of the tolerance around the, uh, so you, you mentioned this branching. And, and yeah. Is that, is that allowed to happen because of the tolerance around the lambda 1? OK, so, so, so the, the austenite martensite interface occurs when the 2 is not 1, the generic case. OK, so if we go back here. Um, Go back to the beginning here, just uh, okay. What else? Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. No. Okay. So there's the branch. If you look very carefully, so there's a new band begins there. That becomes and it splits. It splits. Okay. Actually, this one is better to look at. So there's more, there's, there's, well, there's one, two, three, four bands there, and there's only two back here. Okay, so that's the, that's the branching phenomenon. But this is a case with lambda 2 is not one. This is a generic case. This is what you see when you don't tune to, when you don't bother to. This is, you know, your typical martensitic alloy. If you tune to lambda 2 equals 1, what you see is austenite and single variant of martensite over here. Yeah. And it, the reason that needle was, 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 was because lambda 2 was not quite one. That's the point, yeah. But this branching occurs, it's thought to occur to, to enable a, a further reduction of the elastic transition layer energy here to, without too much penalty of interfacial energy. That's, that's thought, thought to be the reason. So one, one question, right? Yeah. You want to find the MDT. Right. So presumably the thermal conductivity of the field is important. Yeah. And is it the M, which way does it matter? The cooling or the heating? Or do you need it both ways? Both ways. I mean, ideally you would like both. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. So yeah. Thanks again. Yeah. What's that? <laughs>